All right, so we're, yeah, in chapter 11, we're analyzing this concept of faith because when you want to learn about what faith is, how it functions, and, and how it works in, the li- in your life and the lives of others, you, you, chapter 11 is so helpful because, and, and that's great because we, we all desire faith here. On some level, everyone here desires faith. And, and we don't want faith just in the generic sense. We don't, we don't want to have some really loose uh, definition of what faith is. We want to have the specific faith that is Christian, right? We want to have Christian faith, distinctly Christian faith. And Romans, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11 helps us do, that, do this. And I want to start off with a, a quote from Romans, though. In Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about faith, and when he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation who, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I wanted to open with that verse because when Paul's describing the Christian life of faith, he says it's from faith to faith. What he means by by that is he's saying the Christian life of faith, it begins and ends with faith. It, it, it starts and ends, it, it, it begins and concludes by faith. The, this way of life that we have as Christians is by faith. So we need to know what we have faith in and how this faith works. Well, we've spent 10 chapters talking about the object of our faith. That's, that's what Hebrews comes out of the gates just swinging, teaching us about Jesus with these big truth bombs about who he is and teaching us about how Jesus is the object of our faith. He's the high priest who who offers himself as the sacrifice for the sins of God's people. He intercedes for us in this sense, and and it's his righteousness and his atonement through the death on, on the cross that makes us clean. It makes us right before God. And so this is the substance of our faith. We talked about that a few weeks back in As we opened up this chapter, this faith has so much content to it. It's the foundation upon which we build our lives. This is full of so much truth, and it's very specific, and we have a hope that goes beyond what we see. Just just like we read in that catechism, that's why that was the perfect catechism. I had no idea which one was being chosen for today. But we don't believe that this is all that there is. We believe in eternal life, and, and, and again, even that is something very specific. We don't even mean that in the generic sense, as so many people do. I bet the farm, I would bet the farm that 99.9% of people out there think that there's something beyond this. 99.9% of people you would, you would poll right now, <laughs> they would probably say that there is something beyond this life, something beyond what we can see, but how much substance is there to that belief that they hold? They have faith that there's something beyond this, but what substance is there to that faith? I mean, shoot, most people today believe there's even something beyond this for their dog. I've learned something as a pastor the hard way. Don't ever mess with somebody's belief in their dog going to heaven. Like, those are fighting words, right? People can have no scriptural basis for that whatsoever, but man, you, you can mess with Uncle Ernie and his destination in eternity, but don't mess with Fido because all dogs go to heaven. We saw the cartoon, and that's enough. <laughs> right? But is, isn't that incredible? Though that's, I mean, people will die on their sword over this faith that they have in this existence beyond what we can see when there's absolutely no basis, no foundation, no substance to that belief whatsoever. But it's not so with Christians. Like, we have substance to that belief. The the Christian faith is filled with so much meaning. Preaching through Hebrews has been hard because there's so much there to consider. There have been some weeks when I'm preparing a sermon to teach, and I'm just like, oh, man, i got to go read it. Who's Melchizedek? I need to go back here and try to figure out how to teach people who this guy is and how this functions and what it means then what it's teaching us about Jesus, the truth is so vast and it's so deep. There's so much content to the Christian faith, and I'm, I'm so glad that Hebrews doesn't have this flattened out generic explanation of what faith is. I'm so glad. And, and it's, it's almost offensive to me when a Christian portrays faith as a, a flattened out generic concept. 
When a Christian says, well, man, you just got to have faith and it's all good. Well, doesn't that sound easy? <laughs> well, you just got to have faith. It sounds so, I, I, I've even seen those t-shirts. You remember the Got Milk uh, ad campaign? I've seen the Got Faith. Don't you have faith? Well, of course, everybody would say yes to that. It doesn't mean anything. Faith in what? The, the Hebrews, Hebrews gives us something to grab hold of. There is substance to this Christian faith. And so I'm so thankful that there is so much content in Hebrews. I'm thankful that it gets in great detail as to who Jesus is and, and how he functions as our Savior. And so now in Hebrews, after giving us so much content about Jesus, we get to chapter 11, tells us what faith is, and then we get into these examples of, of God's people who lived with faith so we can examine their life and we get to see what faith looks like. And so we, we, we looked at Cain and Abel. I mean, when he gives examples of faith, he goes all the way back to Cain and Abel, the most primitive uh, you know, era of, of human history. And we look at Abel, and we studied Abel so that we can know what faith looks like. Faith is a faith-filled life lives sacrificially. Abel didn't hang on to his possessions in the way Cain did. Because a faith-filled life is one that, that holds our possessions loosely because we're more concerned and more wrapped up in living to the glory of God than grabbing everything for ourselves right here and now. Because we believe that there's more than this. And so faith looks like Abel. It's someone who trusts God. It's someone who obeys God. That's what faith looks like. And we also learned from Abel that faith may very well cost you your life as it did his. But if that's the case, even in death, a life of faith speaks because, because of the faith that was there. So Cain, you know, he was, he was a faithless life and he was just grabbing after what he could and making life all about him. And, and, and that's, that's not what faith does in the, in the life of a person. Faith turns that, that whole attitude upside down. We think of Jesus in Matthew 16, what he says uh, there in verse 25. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So to teach us more about what faith is and what it looks like, he's moving from Cain and Abel to Enoch. So we're going we're gonna to examine the life of Enoch today. And so let's, let's pick up here in chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, and see what he has to say about Enoch. He says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So if today is the first time you've ever heard of Enoch, you know two things about him. Enoch never died. That's pretty unique. Can't say that about very many people in the Bible. Like two. So Enoch never died, and Enoch pleased God, and the, the way that God was pleased with him was because of the faith that existed in the life of of Enoch. And so remember, this was written to a bunch of Jews who would have grown up reading Genesis, maybe memorizing Genesis. And so for the Jews, they would have immediately known everything. Oh, Enoch. Yeah, of course, Enoch. You don't have to get very far into the Bible to start knowing about Enoch. But for us, we're like, oh, e now, e Enoch? What's, who's Enoch? And so the, Enoch is actually only mentioned in three different places in the Bible. So he's mentioned here in Hebrews, he's mentioned in Jude, and he's mentioned in Genesis chapter 5. You don't have to get very far into Genesis at all to get to Enoch. And so if you turn to Genesis 5, I'll reference a couple of places there, and then I'm going to read a portion of it. Genesis 5, that some scholars call Genesis 5 the he died chapter, because everyone dies, <laughs> except Enoch. When you, when you get into chapter 5, you read there, it says, it starts with Adam. Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. Then Seth, his son, lived 912 years, and then he died. Enosh, then, not Enoch, but Enosh, lived 905 years, and then he died. Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. Mahalalel lived 895 years. I practiced that name several times before I preached this. 
He lived 800, only 895 years, uh, not as old as uh, his ancestors, but he, he too died, so young. And then Jared, 962 years old, pretty impressive, but then he died. So in, into the seventh generation, this is where Enoch comes on the scene. Enoch is the only dude in the he died chapter that doesn't die. Let's read about him in verses 21 through 24. It says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God and he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked, or Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. When, uh, yeah, that's, uh, then it gets into Methuselah there. So that, that, there's everything we know about Enoch right there. Pretty old, 365 years old, but not as old as everybody else living around that time. But 365 years old, like can you imagine if, if someone were here today who lived to be 365 years old, that means they were born in 1655. <laughs> I googled 1655 to see what happened. And, and the, the event that kept, kept coming up was that's the year that England attacked Spain and stole Jamaica. Like they battled over Jamaica, and that's why they're not speaking Spanish in Jamaica right now, because in 1655, England was like, I'll take that. So it's crazy to think how much, how much life these individuals lives, and, and there's all sorts of different theories and things that, to, to talk about the length of time, and I, I just don't want to get distracted by some of those arguments today, but I, I want to focus on Enoch and what we're learning about faith through Enoch. And so Enoch, again, is mentioned in Jude. Now, anytime you reference Jude, there's, there's no chapters in Jude. There's just verses because it's so short. So in Jude 14 and 15, when you read about uh, Enoch, as he's referenced in Jude, he is described as a prophet. So we have some more information about Enoch from Jude. So Enoch was this prophet of God. And so he's very old, he, he prophesies, and he has a son named Methuselah, who is famously the oldest person in the entire Bible. But it's interesting that when you, when you learn that he's a prophet in the book of Jude, and then consider what he named his son, it, it's interesting. Because Methuselah, when you look up the meaning of that Hebrew, Hebrew word uh, name, it literally means death by sword or death of sword. And so when you think about Enoch being a prophet, uh, warning of God's judgment, as prophets do, and you think of what he named his son, a lot of scholars come to the conclusion that the name of his son was in itself a prophecy of God's coming wrath upon sin because things were getting so bad. And so a lot of scholars believe that Methuselah was a name that meant once I die, God's wrath's going to come. And then when Methuselah finally does die, that's when the flood takes place, which backs up the theory that Methuselah's name was a, uh, a prophecy of God's coming wrath. So if, you know, that being the case, Enoch nailed it. <laughs> the flood wiped out like all but eight people, and we'll get into that next time we get together. But here's, here's the two big takeaways from Enoch. He walked with God, and he was taken up. So what does it mean to walk with God? This is a very common way to refer to a relationship between God's child and himself, walking with God. I can't help but think when I think of walking with God, going back seven generations from Enoch. Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. We, I think of, of how God existed with Adam and Eve there. And of course, we know how the story goes of Adam and Eve and, and how sin entered the world and, and, and changed everything forever. In Genesis 3, 8, listen to how it describes once this happens, uh, God in the garden. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So there God walking in the garden and existing with God in this sense, walking in the garden, it was changed forever because of sin. It tells us there later in Genesis chapter 3 that after sin, 
the thought for God, the thought of Adam and Eve living forever was so unbearable that he banished them from the Garden of Eden and they would die. So Adam and Eve then go multiplying and, and, and life is different because they are multiplying, but now people are dying. So the concept of walking with God, it didn't end. It was just, it was different. It changed in a sense. And so now when we refer to walking with God, we don't think of walking with God in the midst of paradise, free from sin. We think of walking with God outside of paradise, what we're existing in now, in the midst of sin. And when we speak of walking with God in this sense, we are speaking, we're, we're speaking of, a, of the, the intimacy that exists in, in this relationship. Anytime you talk about walking with someone, right, there's, there's an assumed or an implied relationship that is being discussed. If I say to my wife, hey, let's go for a walk, we don't just walk out different doors of the house and randomly start walking around aimlessly. If I ask my wife to go on a walk, it's, right, it's assumed we're going to walk in the same direction. <laughs> we're going to walk together to an agreed-upon destination and an agreed-upon pace, which is often slow if you're walking with me. No jogging, for sure. But this is what we're talking about when we're walking with God. This, it refers to this relationship, this intimacy that we have with God. And of course, when we're talking about walking with God, we're not talking about taking God where we want to go. We're talking about going with God in the direction that He's going. He, he, in His determined direction. That's what we're talking about when we're walking with with God. And I really feel like this is where cultural Christianity oftentimes gets it wrong, or, or Christianity in our culture. I'll speak to that. We often think that, well, I'm going to walk with God, as, and we say it in this sense I'm going to keep doing whatever it is I was doing, and I'm just going to kind of fit God into to the direction that I'm headed. That's not walking with God, right? And then sometimes that's taken to an extreme like, God, you need, to, you need to walk like me, you need to think like me, you need to evolve like us. And that's not what it means to, to walk with, with God. Um, you know, he, he doesn't, cultures change and, and the, the understanding of morality and things like that changes with the winds of culture, but God never changes, right? We've already learned that in the book of Hebrews. When we're talking about walking with God, we're talking about keeping in step with the Spirit of God. Paul says in Galatians 5, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So you can't just live any way that you want and call it walking with God. That's not how it works. You can't just do whatever you want to do and call it walking by the Spirit. I was uh, learning of a situation back at where I'm from of a pastor who recently uh, started a Bible study in his house, he and his wife, and he invited a small group of people over and and there was a lady who caught his interest, and one thing leads to another. You know how these stories go. Uh, a relationship developed there, an affair developed there. But, and then he eventually leaves his wife, and he, he, he marries this woman who he initially invited to this Bible study they were having in their home. And, and, he, and he said that God led him to do that. He went before his church and said, hey, God, God led me to end the marriage with my wife and, and to start a new marriage with this woman. So I'm being led by the Spirit. I'm walking with God in this new relationship. And, and the, man, the church didn't even fire him. <laughs> you guys would can me in a heartbeat, right? Good, good for you. But, <laughs> but di didn't, didn't fire him. There were no consequences. As a matter of fact, the, his old wife, had, she had to go find another church, and, and the kids had to go find another church. And and he, he said, I was led by the Spirit. You know how we know he's not led by the Spirit, right? It's not a gut feeling. <laughs> it's the Bible. <laughs> it's, we, we have Scripture that tells us what walking in the Spirit is and what that means. Walking in the Spirit doesn't have to do with, desiring, with the desires of the flesh, as Paul says. As a matter of fact, let me read that section to you out of Galatians chapter 5. We're going to eventually get to this in a sermon series after Hebrews, but I couldn't help myself. This is walking by the Spirit according to Paul. When we're walking with God, this is what we mean. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, 
And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and these and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So that's what the Bible means when it says we are to walk with God. We are walking in the ways of God. Living by faith means obeying. Living by faith means trusting. Living by faith means denying ourselves. This is all encompassed in this concept of faith. So it's through faith. We're learning about how faith functions in our life. When we are, when we are living in the Spirit, living by faith, it's through faith that we walk in a direction of holiness. And we stumble a lot of times, right? When we're reading through that list of the desires of the flesh, we, you know, we take a couple of hits. Oh, well, I'm not always walking with God, am I? Right? Because our, our, our sinful natural sinful self as we try to put off our old self and put on our new self in in Christ we we want to pursue this life of holiness this is what it means to live by faith we are drawing near to God through Christ and we are doing so on a path of holiness and then Hebrews in that initial verse that I read there in 5 and 6 Hebrews is incredibly simple yet profound when he says well, to draw near to God, we must believe that he exists. We need to believe that he exists. There's a, there's a conviction of things unseen. So by virtue of being the creator, when we say we're pursuing this path of holiness, it's his path of holiness because he is the way. Whatever he does is good. He's the standard for what is good. We can't ever say or look at something God does and say that's bad because he is the standard for whatever is good. What he does is always good because he is good. And so by faith, we walk this godly path. By faith, we turn from sin. By faith, we repent. By faith, we live sacrificially like Abel. We do all of these things through this concept of faith. And it's so important we don't get this backwards. It's so important we don't get this backwards. We, 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 don't, we don't do these things in order to obtain faith. That's often how we get it wrong. We, we normally think, well, I need to live this holy life so I can have faith. I need to, to live sacrificially so I can obtain this faith. But that's completely and utterly backwards from what the Bible teaches. We live by faith, therefore we do these things in response to the faith that has been gifted to us. And this faith is the factor. It's the factor that determines if God is pleased with us pleased with us or not we see that when we we study about Enoch he is brought up and we learn of that he never died and we learn that he's uh, he, he is commended uh, as having pleased God and the reason he was commending commended having pleased God was because of his faith and without faith it's impossible to please God and so God is pleased with Enoch because of faith. Well, that's what we need to understand about our faith. God is pleased with us because of faith. Again, I'm so thankful that the book of Hebrews goes into great detail about these things so that we can understand that we're not pleasing to God because of our works and deeds. We're not pleasing to, to, to God because of these things. I'm not acceptable to God because of what I do. I'm acceptable to God because of the faith that exists in my life. If, if I had to look to the works and the deeds of my life as, as you know, determining if I'm pleasing to God or not, there's no assurance there. Because we'll always be wondering, have I tipped the scales far enough? Have I done enough good to outweigh the bad? Or have I done enough good to look better than that dude or, or this person over there? There's no assurance there. But what do we learn about faith in Hebrews 11? Faith 
on the other hand, is assurance. Faith is assurance. It's assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and for by it, that is faith, the people of old received their commendation. Enoch was commended because of his faith. That's how faith functions in our relationship with God. And so, by faith, we seek God, and we know that he rewards those who seek him. And we see that Enoch, how is Enoch rewarded? He gets a pretty good reward. (laughs) He skipped death. Again, that's the other thing we learn about Enoch. He skipped death. What did that look like? I have no idea. (laughs) I, I was... Uh, I don't know. I could speculate all day long as to what it looked like. We think of Elijah and things like that later on in Scripture. But what did it look like in the life of Enoch that he skipped death and he was just taken up to be with God? I don't know. I don't know. Enoch was taken up and he was, he was taken up to this unseen heavenly reality with God in the tent not made by man but made by God where, where Jesus is our high, pri- high priest intercedes for us. It, it's, he was taken up to, to a realm free of sin. It's paradise. And that's where you and I are headed if we have faith. I think ultimately, this is why I believe Enoch is mentioned here. Enoch is mentioned in this chapter about faith because I believe that he is he's this microcosm of the bigger picture. Those who walk by faith in the midst of a sinful world, you know, we may or may not get to skip death like Enoch, depending on when Christ returns or not. But regardless, our faith will result in eternal life in paradise with our Creator, just like Enoch. So faith, ultimately, at the end of the day, it functions in our lives in the same sense that it functioned in the life of Enoch. Through faith, the reality that Enoch experienced is ours right now. Like, Jesus has prepared a place for us in eternity free from sin, and that is as good as ours now through faith. His sinless life is why when we get there in that place that he has prepared for us, we will actually be clothed in righteousness, it teaches us in in Revelation 19. The bride is clothed in in the righteousness that Christ has provided because he has prepared a place for us there. And so faith in these heavenly realities. That's what we walk with in in this life. And and that faith in these heavenly realities, that is our commendation now. We have faith in this and we are commended now. We We are pleasing to God right now through faith and faith alone. And so the... This is the truth that we always drive our service back to each and every time that we gather because we're so prone to wander wander from this faith. We're so prone to want to look to our deeds. We're so prone to want to prove ourselves by what we do and how we live and how we interact with this world. But we we are not pleasing to God based on those things. Do those things matter? Sure they matter. But they're a response to the faith that we have in these heavenly realities in our high priest Jesus. And so we, we go into that time of communion each and every Sunday to remember the works of Christ. It's the works of Christ alone. We have faith in the works of Christ. So it's through faith alone because we, we have hope in Christ alone, his death and his righteousness. It's faith in these realities that makes us pleasing to God right Now, that is what it means to live with the Christian faith. And so we're going to keep crawling through the book of Hebrews and in chapter 11 to examine life, what life looks like when it has faith so that we can better live out our faith here and now. So let's go, let's have a word of prayer and then Drew will lead us in some worship and we'll go into a time of communion.